So we have just completed our look at Raja Yoga. To give a thumbnail sketch of the other three so that you can round out your notes and then we can pick it up tomorrow. We still got we, we still got some time, so give me five, ten minutes to round out these other three yogas so that you at least have a sketch definition for your notes. And these uh, won't take as long anyway because I don't need to go through the eight steps, which are part of Raja Yoga. Bhakti has to do with love and devotion. Bhakti. Love and love. Sorry, devotion. Love and devotion. Yeah. Love. Bhakti. Love. So basically, what happens is this. Hinduism says it's okay to practice in different ways. You might not be the sort to practice meditation. Or it might not be the right time in your life to develop a, a meditation practice. Maybe you are the devotional sort. And it's perfectly acceptable to practice that way, as long as it's not done superficially as long as it's done with all of your being and all of your heart. Because when you love and you devote yourself to someone, maybe you've experienced this in your own lives, at that moment you don't care about yourself. You would do anything for that person you love. And so look what's happening. In the rightful practice of bhakti yoga, you lose the sense of the self. Isn't that what happened in samadhi, in raja yoga? You lose that sense of the self. But too often in our world, and what we call love is most, you know, is too often not love at all. It's just some form of hideous attachment. An but in a situation, huh? An obsession. An obsession. <laughs> but when you truly love someone, you don't expect something in return. And you're not sickly attached so that you're monitoring the other person's actions and you're distrusting them and you're jealous and you're questioning them. I mean, in a situation where love is truly there, you don't care what's in it for you. You almost lose the sense of self in the process of loving someone else. You're moving toward the divine in the Hindu practice of bhakti yoga. You're chanting because chanting purifies that heart chakra. You're seeing the self, which is divine, and not separate. It's tough to really practice bhakti yoga. It sounds easy. Oh good, I don't have to sit on the cushion for an hour every day, or whatever it is. Oh good. But do you know what? It's tougher than you think, because of that judgmental mind. It's tough to get past that. It's tough to drop the expectations that we place on others in these relationships that are labeled love relationships. It really is. And so when you do that as a spiritual practice, you're using the idea of the divinity as a way of bringing you past yourself and entering into the, the divine directly. And it takes some dedication. Karma yoga? Do you remember what I said about karma yoga? What does that word mean? Action. And again, this word has been often misunderstood because it's a word that's been imported into English and we bring to it all of our um, biases that come from our own culture and our own religious backgrounds and we hear the word karma and we think, oh, that's your bad karma, like it's some sort of destiny, some sort of sentence. But that's not what karma means, it just means action. This unavoidable, almost like physics, this unavoidable tendency for actions to beget similar kinds of reactions in the plane of material existence. I touch the water and I make little ripples. Well, as spiritual practice, this word karma yoga refers to the things that you do in your life. The Bhagavad Gita, which I hope you've opened, says, you're a householder, no time to meditate? Then do what you do in the spirit of selflessness, in the spirit of self-service, self-sacrifice. Sacrificing 
repeated as a refrain, as a refrain throughout the Bhagavad Gita, in the spirit of self-sacrifice, where you stop looking out for the fruits of your actions. You're not acting just for what's in it, you know, for you. You're doing it because it's the right thing to do, because it's your duty in life, according to your station in life. And if you work in the sense of selfless service, rather than letting yourself get distracted, oh, well, did they see that I did that? Did they see that it was my idea? Did they? That's the extra stuff. That's the unsimple stuff. Come back to simplicity again, and just do your work in a spirit of self-discipline and sacrifice. That's karma yoga. And I'm going fast so that we can at least say something about all of them. Jnana yoga means knowledge. And I know it's spelled funny and it's not spelled the way it sounds, Gyan yoga. It just means knowledge. And it means coming to an understanding of the difference between reality and illusion. It has to do with overcoming maya. Illusion. Again, overcoming the sense of separateness. You see all the yogas have that in common. Getting beyond the self. Life teaches you to believe that it is real. You feel you must have your food and sleep every day that you'll die without them. Again, he talks about your habits compelling you to live in certain ways living a crazy lifestyle. We all crazily dream different limitations on our consciousness. And when we slip into the rut of, ba of a bad dream, wrong behavior, we have a hard time pulling ourselves up out of it. If you're too much identified with this dream form, you become hopelessly immersed in delusion. In other words, again, we come back to that realm of material life where we find ourselves stuck and enslaved by the call of the senses. But that has everything to do with overcoming illusion. Paramahansa says to see this material world as like a dream state. It's not all real. I'm not this material body having to be to every degree of the senses. I'm deeper than that. I'm more profound than that. I am not love. A lot, a lot, a lot today because I wanted to get to the four yoga in one swoop so we can see the movie about the sadhus tomorrow. And so I did it. He's asking about bhakti yoga and whether it entails devotion to a deity. Yes. Here's my agenda. Tomorrow we've got the sadhu video. But guess what's on Thursday? I'm going to show you pictures of deities, which are such a colorful and wonderful part of the practice. And so, yes, traditionally, bhakti yoga refers to the dedication of the self to a certain deity. And typically, you have those who are devoted to Vishnu, in particular Krishna, or you have Shaivites, those who are dedicated to Shiva. To sum it up for, for what I want to have on the board today, it's this desire to understand, perhaps on an intellectual level, the difference between reality and illusion. But of course, true understanding surpasses intellectual understanding. And so ultimately, you would come to understand experientially that you are not bound by the limitations of this body, which is like, like a dream. This whole material plane is like a dream state that keeps us trapped in the world of illusion. And so beyond yoga is almost like, like coming up for air out of the water. You can breathe and you can truly see what reality is that you are Atman, you are being in a more profound sense than just the body, and it's sensitive. Well, they work together, and that one passage I read to you from the Yoga Sutras uh, was great because he was explaining how you're working with concentration while you're working in a pose, while you're working with the breath, um, but obviously you're not sitting in meditation while you're in a triangle pose or something like that. So there are times when one takes precedence over another, or where one is stronger than another in terms of your practice at this time in your life. And so you're working your way into a deeper ability to use the different steps. Sometimes more than others, even from one day to the next, because one day you're tired and you're out of focus.